Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the World Affairs Council of San Antonio program. We have a great presentation today uh, with some very special guests uh, from different parts of the country representing different parts of the world. And uh, I want to jump right into thanking all of you for watching. We also have uh, an audience on Facebook who are watching. If you have any questions at any time, uh, Robert Barnett, who's our uh, moderator, he will um, go to the Q&A uh, probably halfway through the, uh, the discussion. So please uh, put it in the Q&A. No need to put it in the chat. Facebook audience, if you could comment um, on the post that is streaming right now, um, we will also attend to those questions. This is being recorded, so we could also show it and, and send it out after the fact. Um, I want to thank the University of uh, the Incarnate Word for sponsoring our webinars this, whole, this entire month, and I think for July too. So we really appreciate UIW uh, and Julie Weber's support for this. We want to thank our promoting sponsor, uh, Asociación de Empresarios Mexicanos, which is AEM. We appreciate their support and their promotion as well. Uh, we have got many people viewing, and I understand from um, the registration link that the uh, Secretary of State Hughes, who was a guest here just a few weeks ago with our friend Jorge Canavati, uh, is also tuned in. So thank you to the Secretary of State. Um, I'm going to briefly mention our guests and jump right in so you can hear from uh, our wonderful uh, uh, public servants here. Uh, Congressman Cuellar is the eighth term uh, congressman representing the 28th district, uh, which spans considerably uh, large areas, San Antonio going all the way down to Laredo and everything in between. And, um, and he's on the, he serves on the Appropriations Committee uh, as well as on the uh, Subcommittee for Homeland Security. And uh, you could find his full bio in the chat room. He's got, it's a pretty extensive one. All the bios for these wonderful people are gonna be in the chat room so you can uh, check them out on your own. Um, Consul General Rachel McCormick of Canada, she joins us. She covers Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. Uh, can we add more? <laughs> That's quite a list. That's a large area to cover. Um, she has been the head of energy and environment section at the Canadian Embassy in DC. She's also worked at the World Trade Organization in Geneva, um, and she is uh, uh, tuning in from Dallas. So we appreciate her for tuning in. Uh, Consul General Ruben Minuti Zanata. He is the Consul General for uh, Mexico right here in San Antonio. He's new to San Antonio. We're so happy to have him here. Uh, he came in January. Uh, he's been a public servant for over 20 years, uh, doing some extraordinary things. Uh, and his bio is going to be in the chat room. One quick note that's not in his bio is that he has translated the U.S. Constitution to Spanish, which I find very impressive. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, extraordinary. And I appreciated the Consul General Minuti for joining us at the International Citizen of the Year uh, just uh, at last March. So thank you for that. Please join us for, uh, uh, if you wanna be a member, there are membership opportunities, which are in the chat room, as well as your donation to support the World Affairs Council of San Antonio. So thank you so much for tuning in. Last but not least, Robert Barnett is a board member for the World Affairs Council. He's a partner with Cashew, Cavazos, and Newton. Um, he is, does a lot of work um, between, Me he has clients in Mexico and in the US. He has taught international business law and something called the NAFTA agreement that uh, he also has taught um, and owns a very fine restaurant called Sancho's in San Antonio, which he doesn't like me promoting, but I will because it's got some good food and good margaritas. So without further ado, I want to thank all of you for joining us and uh, Robert Barnett will take it away. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it, Armin, the invitation. Uh, thank you to Julie Weber and to UIW for supporting this program. And of course, to our guests. Uh, this is a very exciting time for everyone uh, in our three countries, I think. Uh, next week on July 1st, the USMCA is what we call it in the US, 
course, in Mexico, it's referred to as the TMEC or the TEMEC. And in Canada, it's referred to as the, the CUSMA or the CUSMA. Uh, very exciting that it's going into effect next week. And I think the first question that I'd like to lead off with our panelists uh, and start off, uh, if I could, with Congressman Cuellar is what Congressman Cuellar do you see as some of the key takeaways, some of the key conclusions and things that we should be looking for as the USMCA takes effect next week? Well, first of all, uh, we're looking forward to that implementation on July 1st. Uh, I think this is a very important um, agreement between the US and Mexico and Canada. Uh, without due respect, this agreement is almost the same that we had under NAFTA, except the name was changed and I can understand why our administration wanted to change it. It went from the worst agreement to now this quote beautiful agreement. Uh, for us on the border and Canada, Mexico, we understand that trade is very important. And, and Laredo, for example, my hometown that alternates with LA, uh, Long Beach as the number one port, not only land port, but land port. Uh, we understand that every day between the US and Mexico, as an example, there's more than $1.7 billion of trade. That's over a million dollars of trade every single minute uh, that we have. So this agreement is basically the same agreement we had, except we modernize uh, some of the things because 20 years ago plus, it's not the same type of economy, new innovation, new e-commerce, uh, new state uh, enterprises. We understand uh, that this um, uh, agreement is gonna be done. Uh, this was part, as you recall, uh, recall uh, this is something that we wanted to work on to make sure it happened. And I certainly wanna thank not only Robert Leisheiser and of course uh, the Canadian counterpart, uh, Jesus Saide on the Mexican side. We spent a lot of time together to get this done and it was finally done. And I'm glad that this is, uh, is gonna be implemented. I know that um, uh, next week I'm setting up, I'm the chairman of the US-Mexico Intramolumentary uh, uh, group. Uh, and I've been talking to my counterpart, Mario Delgado, where we will do a Zoom call uh, with Mexican and American um, uh, legislators to talk about the uh, implementation. So this is a, a victory for um, uh, for not only Canada, Mexico, the United States, but for us as a region to have this new uh, uh, trade agreement. It's Again, it's basically the same, quite honestly, but it's modernized to fit the, uh, fit the uh, new times with different names, of course, but it's still NAFTA 2.0 in my opinion. Well, thank you, Congressman Cuellar. Uh, Consul General McCormick, uh, from your perspective, uh, key takeaways, things that we should be looking for. Sure. Um, thanks, first of all, to the World Affairs Council of San Antonio, and I, I look forward to meeting my counterpart in, in uh, San Antonio from the Mexican government. And Congressman, it was great to see you in Laredo during the Washington birthday celebrations. It seems like a long time ago now, um, but I think that the, that bridge ceremony was something I'll always remember. Uh, and looking at the movement of goods across that bridge uh, was also really, really something I'll take away. Um, and so one of the things I always like to think about as we go into this, as you say, modernized agreement, like I think if you look back 25 years ago, we had a lot of sectors that didn't exist now. Trade was different then. And so we've modernized it in some really important ways. Um, but yes, it is a NAFTA 2.0 in some ways. But what's happened since we signed that agreement, I think, is also really important. Canada is very committed to free trade. Uh, we started... Uh, um, you know, 1994, we have had a fourfold increase in economic activity since then between North America, within North America. And so we now have a $22 trillion regional market with over 480 million consumers. That's the biggest free trade region. And so that creates great opportunities for our communities, our businesses, and our people. And I think by having this free movement of goods and trades and services, um, it really provides opportunity for prosperity and growth. And for, for Canada, one of the things is that it's a progressive trade agreement. So we've incorporated a lot of elements that make sure that we're giving consideration to small and medium-sized enterprises. We're giving consideration to the new economy. We're giving um, consideration explicitly to things like labor, environment. We're talking about digital trade. So I think all of that makes sure that we're ready for the future economy, but also that it's an inclusive and progressive trade approach within the continent. Thank you, Consul General. 
Uh, Consul General Minuti, uh, from your perspective, sitting in San Antonio, representing the Mexican government, uh, what key uh, takeaways and, and, and sort of uh, things to be looking for uh, do you see? Prof, thank you very much. Before, I mean, first of all, I, I, I need to, I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm going to take a minute to thank you all. Uh, this, is a, this is an honor. I'm honored uh, by participating in this panel. I know we're, we uh, need to hurry up because we're all very busy, but this was very generous of you to include us. Uh, it's an honor to be with uh, Consul General McCormick and with Congressman Cuellar. And of course, uh, in current word, uh, Armin, uh, you, uh, Rob, thank you very much. It's hard to be the last one because there's, there's very little left uh, to say. I coincide, I subscribe every single thing uh, my predecessors said, uh, Consul uh, McCormick and um, Congressman uh, Cuellar. They, they, they also mentioned the key words. It is definitely uh, uh, modernizing. It is uh, giving continuity to what we had before. It is, it, it is it's also perfecting uh, what we had. Uh, and I understand Const uh, Congressman Cuellar, it is very similar, but I think that he used the right word too. It is a victory, but because even though it is very similar, it has new uh, improvements and uh, most of all, it, it's proving the world that, that what is natural because we're neighbors is happening. We, we need to, this is something that we must do because we're neighbors, so we need to integrate. We need to, uh, integration is a must because we are also fortunate, very fortunate to have one of the largest markets in the world. If we, do, if we do not take advantage of that, I, I don't know what, what, what we're doing. So uh, we are, we're doing what, what common sense dictates. And, and, that, and it is what we're doing. And we prove the, the, the rest of the world that we're capable of reaching agreements in a very civilized way, even though we are very different in many ways. So I am proud. I'm proud to be a, a part of this uh, continent or subcontinent of, of North America. I'm proud to have these partners, Canada and the US. We are, we are proud to reach these high level agreements. This is probably the most modern agreement or trade agreement or free trade agreement in the world now, I, 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 it's hard to tell, but we, we, we might be able to uh, affirm that. So uh, it is reciproc reciproc <clears throat> excuse me, reciprocally beneficial. I mean, this is, this is, this is a, big, a big step. Um, so I, I have not, not much uh, to, to add because they, they say it in a very clear uh, way. So I subscribe how they said, so we can go ahead. Thank you, Rob. Okay, thank you, uh, Consul General Minuti. Um, Consul General McCormick, you mentioned a couple of, uh, of key sectors uh, in your remarks, but I wanted to ask Congressman Cuellar, what sectors, uh, uh, economic sectors, industrial sectors uh, that we can expect to see uh, emphasized or accentuated uh, with the USMCA, uh, and, and hear your remarks on that, Congressman Cuellar. Well, let, let, let me put it more to answer that question. Let me just put it uh, a little bit more why this will help a lot of the chain supplies that we have. It, it, look, when you have an import that comes in from, let's say, China or Europe, it will have about four to five, well, about 4% American parts in it. If something comes in from Canada, it will have about 24, 25% American parts of it. But if an import comes in from Mexico, it will have a 40% uh, American parts on it. So that would show you how much the economies between Canada and the US, and especially the US and Mexico are connected. Uh, so whether this was the automobile uh, area, whether this is the ag area, uh, this is something that's going to be helping generally all because usually when you think about people that import and export, we usually think of big multi uh, corporations, big corporations. But if you look at it, over 80% of the companies uh, that are involved in trade are small, medium sized companies. So this is going to help a lot of the, um, uh, the more medium sized companies uh, that will be beneficial to create jobs in the U.S. Uh, on the Mexican side and on the Canadian side itself also. So this is a win-win uh, situation. I would say this, um, that uh, this agreement, even though I've been using it, it's the same agreement, 
it's modernized, it, 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 it made some changes, but the work that we did on labor and the environment, I'll, and I'm sure you're gonna ask a question about the uh, Nat Bank in a few minutes, but I would say that in our eyes, this has now become a template in the US, in the US Congress for other trade agreements uh, because of the provisions we added for labor and environment and some other areas also. So those are great points, Congressman Cuellar. And yes, you're absolutely right. We, we, we will be touching on those, uh, those other topics uh, here shortly. Uh, Consul General uh, McCormick, you had mentioned small and medium-sized enterprises uh, and uh, digital trade. Are there any other uh, industries or sectors from your perspective uh, representing the Canadian government uh, that you see uh, a focus on with uh, the revamped USMCA? Sure. Let me just kind of dig into those two a little bit and then touch on one more. So if you think about um, digital trade, right? So we weren't ordering from Amazon. We weren't ordering um, videos, games, et cetera, 26 years ago. And so now we have rules, we have an agreed approach to protect and advance the ability for consumers to access music, movies, games, also physical goods to be couriered anywhere. And so these rules will facilitate that economic growth and trade through the use of the inter internet while protecting people's privacy and also thinking about important security issues. So I think that's really important, getting into the concretization of what digital trade actually means and the opportunities it presents. SMEs, like the Congressman said, actually 90% of the private sector workforce in Canada is employed by SMEs. It's a huge proportion of our population. So the fact that we're focusing in on opportunities for them is important. Um, autos, I think, is something that has gotten a lot of attention in the course of the negotiation of this agreement. And so I think the outcome in terms of rules of origin has ensured that the benefits of the agreement are really being borne by the signatories. So over time, moving to a 75% requirement for North American content, 70% um, steel and aluminum for North America, and also really unique that um, 40 to 45% of the value of the car being produced by labor earning $16 an hour or more. And so I think that that's a very, very unique 21st century element that's specific to one sector. Um, but it also means that the people and businesses within North America are really going to benefit in this sector. Sure. No, absolutely. That, those, are, those are very, very relevant and on-point uh, comments that I think all of us are, are watching and, 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 and seeing. Uh, uh, Consul General uh, uh, Minuti, from your perspective representing the Mexican government, uh, what are some of the priorities that, that you've been seeing over the last you know, couple of years as this got negotiated? Are there certain industry sectors or or topics, issue areas that the Mexican government has focused on and, and that you'd like to comment on? Absolutely, Rob. And again, I wanna retake uh, uh, my predecessor's uh, words. Uh, Congressman Cuellar said, this is a win-win and I agree with him. And I would add another win, a win-win-win, you know? <laughs> this is a, uh, a triple, a trifecta. <laughs> then uh, I also agree with Consul General McCormick. There are many new things which is natural after 25 years. And, and there are big challenges about it. Uh, we were not contemplating this pandemic, but uh, which is also new, uh, but uh, we are uh, taking into account new technologies, of course. And also we are taking into account all the issues that we didn't take in, in, in NAFTA, like the social uh, uh, issues and uh, of course, environmental, issues that are stronger this time they are uh, this is a big uh, deal now it, it is well it was always a big deal but it is it is respected in a better way in this new agreement which uh, should make make us all happy and 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 proud of this because this is a long time uh, view so we 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 should have done something like that before but i mean it, it's it is what it is or it was what it was now we are taking into account the very important issues that we couldn't or we forgot. Anyway, uh, yes, from our perspectives, uh, th this is nothing new. You all know that Mexico, Mexico has very specific uh, interest in, 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 the, in our natural uh, areas, uh, the, the, the car industry, I mean, auto parts, uh, agricultural products and um, labor force. Um, 
the, the, the traditional the, 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 the traditional suspects that you all know, because this is another uh, interesting and fortunate thing that we complement each other. We're, we're lucky, unlike other parts of the world, other regions, we do complement each other. Complement each other. Uh, uh, these our three countries have something to offer to the other two countries that is actually convenient because it, it is something uh, that we do not uh, have or produce or uh, develop in the same way. So it is it is very uh, interesting that we complement each other and we figure that out and we are exploiting that in, in the in the smartest way possible. So yes, these are the the, the big. Uh, we we also want to uh, develop better uh, some industries that were not natural to us, like telecommunications and, and uh, others. And we have a lot to improve with our two partners that are definitely helpful for us to uh, start a new development stage for different industries that we want to uh, grow and that we want to uh, develop at the same level of our partners, which is a lot to say. I don't know if that's uh, more or less uh, what uh, you were looking for, uh, Rob. No, ab absolutely. Thank you, uh, uh, Coltsman Minuti, uh, very much uh, speaking to that. And as we prepared for this event, um, Armin uh, from the World Affairs Council and I, we talked about the importance of regionalization. We talked about how the world seems to have maybe skipped over the importance of regionalization and gone to globalization without really seeing the importance of working with our neighbors uh, and the natural progression of moving from a, a country by country focus to a regional focus and then maybe eventually to a global focus. But I wanted to, to lead off with, with Congressman Cuellar asking him for his thoughts, comments about the importance of regionalization, regional cooperation, and then of course uh, make some remarks about what I think is a really emblematic institution of successful regional development and regionalization, which we have in the North American Development Bank. Congressman Cuellar. Uh, thank you. You know, and you're right. Look, you know, by geography, uh, the design of geography, you have the United States, you have Mexico, you have uh, Canada. Uh, so we should be naturally uh, seeing each other. We should be seeing each other as a region. Uh, when you think about how we can counter countries like China and other areas, it only makes sense that we look at the area, the three countries as a region. For example, uh, before the prices of energy started going down because of you know, two main reasons, um, you know, we were looking at Texas uh, uh, mainly, but you know, the US, Canada, Mexico uh, as a powerhouse when it came to energy, not the Middle East, but uh, us as three areas where there was oil and gas uh, you know, we were looking at this as an area. Uh, we have to see each other as, as an area and we got to make sure that whatever words are spoken out of Washington uh, or, or, or Mexico City or, or in Canada, that they have to make sure that we see each other as friends. Uh, and again, without due respect, uh, when somebody sees Mexico as an enemy and sees Russia as a friend, we know our world has been turned upside down. I disagree with that vision totally. The Rio Grande does not divide us, but unites us as two countries. Los une como dos naciones. And same thing with the Canadian border. We should be seeing each other as neighbors. So this regional approach uh, only makes sense, not only for the economies, uh, but basically as a counterweight uh, when we see some other powerhouses uh, in other parts of the world. So it's only uh, natural. And we've had different successes. I know we're going to talk about the Nat Bank, but that has been one area where we've done some things regional uh, uh, in approach. And, and as I mentioned a while ago, something comes in from Europe or China, it will have about 4% American parts. Canada, 24. Mexico, 40% American parts. So that shows us how um, uh, closely interrelated we are with the Canadians and with the Mexicans. That's right, Congressman, and I think uh, Consul General Minuti mentioned that word of complementary, how we complement each other. Um, Consul General McCormick, uh, on this topic of regionalization, uh, are, there, are there institutions or are there areas that you can envision that the three countries could further cooperate and further uh, collaborate together uh, in the future? 
Sure. And I think, um, you know, it's a continuation on, on the environment. So the North American Commission for Environmental Cooperation was originally established through the side agreement under the NAFTA. And actually they're having their um, annual ministerial meeting tomorrow virtually. They're still keeping those meetings going. But as the, as the USMCA, the modernized NAFTA came into play, um, we brought an environment chapter into the text of the agreement. And that um, brought the new provisions that really um, created a comprehensive and enforceable chapter that aims to raise and improve environment standards in all the three countries. So building on the work of the CEC and having an established work program that gets us working together, I think is really important. It talks about our obligations internationally. It talks about cooperating on environmental challenges like wildlife trade, um, illegal physics, conserving species, but also marine pollution, uh, things like that. So I think that's a really concrete example of other regional collaboration, because as you know, um, you know, birds don't have passports, water doesn't have to, you know, go through a custom zone to get anywhere. Those things go between our countries every day and they affect the quality of life for the people and the businesses that we that we that we need to survive in terms of our societies and our economy. Th thank you, Consul General. And and I guess the same question for Consul General Minuti, um, his perspective uh, representing the Mexican government on uh, on regional cooperation and perhaps other areas and, and maybe even new areas that we could consider uh, for regional cooperation. Thank you, Rob. Well, again, um, we didn't choose to be neighbors. This is a geographical issue, but we, we can choose to be friends, as very well uh, uh, Congressman Cuellar said. And uh, I think that's a smart thing to choose because it is, it is very convenient. And the technicalities, the technical issues can be solved. And this is a, this is a proof of it. This, this agreement is showing that we can solve the technicalities, the technical issues in a smart way, in a convenient way for the three of us. So uh, uh, that being said, uh, I think that uh, as again, as uh, Congressman Cuellar said, we need to think of us as a block. It's one block of uh, one group of friends that can do things together and are doing and having it, having doing it for 25 years with a, with a lot of success. So we can do it, we can do it, uh, we can keep doing it even better. And uh, Oh, another very important uh, ingredient is uh, that multilateral, multilateralism uh, for the three countries is, is now more important than it was before. And we're developing this in a very uh, smart way too. I, I also, if, if, if I can have the, uh, the liberty to share with you that uh, our government, the Mexican government, just announced the candidacy of Dr. Jesus Seade to, uh, to uh, lead the WTO uh, and and we, we think we have a strong North American candidate. It's not Mexican, it's not American, it's not Canadian, it's a North American candidate. And it will be very important for uh, North America to, uh, to, be, to have a, 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 a member of its uh, three nation community as the head of the WTO. I'm sorry to mention that, but that's something that I, I wanted to share with you. We think we have a strong candidate and we will love our partners to support uh, Dr. Jesus Seade. We think he has great uh, potential and, and, and great uh, possibilities to, to be the head of the WTO. Anyhow, uh, Rob, I think that uh, it, what is important to Mexico, it is getting uh, to be also recognized as, as important to our two partners. So we are, uh, we are working in a common agenda in, a, in the technical way, the, the, the commerce part, the commercial part, and also the other issues that go together now with commerce, which, has, which are environmental, issues, labor issues, uh, social issues, and uh, uh, anti-corruption. We, uh, we didn't mention that before, and that is very important for us because we're working very hard. And you can, you can tell it's not just that we are talking about it. We're working very hard on that. And you can, you can see in the work of our president and, and our uh, administration, our Congress, uh, our, uh, our judiciary is working very hard to get rid of that, which is a big, big challenge that we have. And together with our partners, we're stronger to, to, to fight that. Yes. That would be it, Rob. Well, thank you, um, Consul General Minuti. Um, I'd like to turn, first of all, uh, to, to thank uh, Congressman Cuellar for his time, and but give him one more opportunity 
uh, before he needs to bow out of the meeting. Uh, again, being very generous and respectful uh, with your time uh, to, uh, to talk to us about something that's near and dear to us in South Texas, at least, but I think regionally along the US-Mexico border, and that's the, the North American Development Bank, something that Congressman Cuellar, you were instrumental in helping uh, to get uh, recapitalized uh, and, and, and re-supported. So uh, can you give us an update on that as another example of, of successful regional cooperation? Uh, yes, and before I do that, I, I certainly, um, um, uh, Council, I just want to say my, my best to uh, uh, Jesus Sade. I know him very well. In fact, uh, after this, I'm going to send him a little WhatsApp and congratulate him. And certainly, I hope that uh, we as a region support him because he is a excellent candidate and he's the, the right person for that type of position. So please send my, my best to uh, uh, Dr. Sade. Absolutely. So, and also, before I leave, also um, to the Canadian General Council Retro, I think what you were referring to was when we are with the Mexican ambassador, we were with Kansas City, we had a train right in the middle of the bridge uh, uh, in the Rio Grande, uh, um, and we were talking about the importance of this agreement between the U.S. and Mexico, so I certainly want to thank you for being down there, and hopefully we'll see you at the next George Washington birthday celebration. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, um, you know, what are the areas before I go in, because I know we got Incarnate Word and I have to plug Incarnate Word. My, uh, one of my daughters graduated from there with a finance major. But, uh, you know, we have to do a lot more just than talk about economics. The environment is important. The Rio Grande, we got to take care of that. Uh, an issue that I've been working on is adding money for appropriations uh, on the, uh, uh, the seaweed uh, issue that we have in Cancun and the Gulf Coast of Mexico and how that affects uh, the countries also in the Gulf of Mexico. Also, we got to talk about getting more students uh, like in Carnet Word and other universities do uh, to have them study in Mexico, come to the U.S., uh, go to Canada and that type of interchange of uh, students, uh, professors, join scientific studies uh, is going to be uh, extremely important. So there's a lot of areas uh, that we can uh, look at. Um, uh, but one of the areas on the environment part of it has to do with the NAT Bank. Uh, I, had, I had filed that legislation, I had passed out a committee, uh, but when I saw the UMCA, uh, I always look at what we say here in Washington, look for the train that has moved and you jumped in. Uh, so instead of uh, going on a separate bill, uh, I talked to Speaker Pelosi I talked to Robert Lysheiser about it, about adding, and, and with his suicide also, about adding the bill into the uh, into this legislation, uh, in the implementing uh, legislation, and it did pass. Uh, so we recapitalized it. Uh, it's going to be important for uh, border communities. And on top of that, we added hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for the EPA to address that issue in the California and Mexican side also. So NatBank, as you know, based in San Antonio, and I certainly want to send my best to them, uh, has been very, very, very important to both sides. We need to have more of those uh, projects uh, along the borders uh, because it is something that jointly helps uh, both sides. I'll, I'll close up with this. Some years ago, uh, NatBank came in and helped us because in Nuevo Laredo, the city of Cross Laredo, there were uh, dumping about 25 million gallons of raw sewage in the Rio Grande. Uh, and from there, we were able to work with NatBank. I was in the state legislature. We got some money from the state legislature with the Mexican government, and we developed uh, this uh, uh, waste treatment plant in Nuevo Laredo. And those are the things that is good for the environment. Uh, and those are the type of projects that we want. You know, on the border, we say, no muro, we don't want a wall. We'd rather have, uh, you know, sewage plants, water plants, uh, ways so we can take care of the border instead of uh, wasting billions of dollars on this uh, 14th century solution called the wall itself. There are so many things we can do. Uh, good neighbors don't build walls between them. Uh, we build bridges, uh, and certainly we want to have bridges uh, between the U.S. and Canada, and certainly between our friends in Mexico. And with that, I'm going to uh, jump into another call with uh, some of the other border congressmen. But, but I'll say this last thing on coordination. We have to keep talking to each other. You know, one of the things we saw was the, uh, the essential trade 
uh, and the uh, maquiladoras where we might have had something open in the U.S., maybe not in Mexico. I know that Will heard of myself. Uh, I talked to uh, Marcelo. I talked to Marcelo Ebron uh, and, and uh, Pompeo so we can make sure we coordinate. The other thing that we have to look at, and I'll close up with this, and I want uh, both of the general counsels to think about this one. Look, I, I understand this uh, COVID-19 and the border restrictions. I understand all that. But I have a question for y'all, uh, a question that I'm going to ask Chad Wolf when I sit, uh, the secretary, uh, when I talk to him next week, uh, is why is it, and, and I might be wrong on this, but somebody correct me on this if I'm wrong, why is it that the border restrictions only apply to land ports and not to airports and seaports? Why do we, uh, I don't want to use the word discriminate because it's been used a lot lately, but why are we putting those restrictions on land port of entries and not seaports and airports uh, on that. Uh, because I understand the balance between, you know, what's happening with COVID-19, what's happening in Mexico, what's happening in the U.S. and Canada. Um, uh, and there are certain things that we can do at land ports, but I just have a problem uh, when we put border restrictions on land ports and not seaports. So if somebody flies, are they less susceptible to get COVID-19 or is somebody that crosses a land port uh, is more at risk for getting uh, uh, COVID-19? So unless if I'm wrong, uh, Council Generals, uh, this is something that I'm going to be talking to uh, Chad Wolf and, uh, and see if we can find a better way that we can provide safety uh, to the health of the individual. But we still got to look at uh, uh, tourism, as you know, uh, before COVID-19, actually before President Trump came in, uh, Mexico was sending about 18 million Mexicanos as tourists, and they were spending $19 billion. So now that we've taken that out of the essential trade, uh, tourists are not coming over. Uh, we know what's happening in uh, La Cantera. We know what's happening in North, North Star. We know what's happening in Laredo, McCann, and other areas. You got the small business owners who are really hurting, and I'm sure the same thing in Mexico and Canada. So... Just a little foot of thought. Uh, uh, um, I want you to think about that and maybe we can follow up uh, and talk about this a little bit more. Land ports versus seaports, airports, what's the difference? Rob, thank you. Before Congressman, I'm sorry, can I, may I? Please. Just one minute. Congressman, before you leave, I, I want to thank you about Dr. Seade. I will pass your message and I appreciate it very much. And second, I wanted to thank uh, the organizers, uh, uh, World Affairs Council and uh, Armin, to include such such a representative for the border region, as is a Congressman Cuellar, because the border is its own its own world. I don't think there's a border in the whole world, or has been ever, like the border between Mexico and the U.S. with its complexity and its challenges. So I am very happy and proud that somebody like Congressman Cuellar is representing that region that is so important and crucial for our trade agreement. That would be it, and I'm sorry, I apologize for taking this, this minute to thank and, and to point this out. Sorry about that, Rob. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you, Rachel, again, and General Council, I hope to see you. I'll, I'll go visit you in San Antonio soon. Uh, I was gonna go this week uh, to San Antonio, but I fly back uh, to Loreto. It's my wife's, uh, uh, my wife, uh, my uh, 28th anniversary, so and then I got to fly back again next week. Okay. I'm in Laredo 24 hours, but hopefully next time I'm in San Antonio, I'll see you in Carnivore. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. It's always a pleasure, uh, Robert. To you and the World Council, just let me say thank you for a great job what y'all do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman Cuellar. Felicidades on your anniversary. Thank yes, you, Congressman. So congressman. Bye bye. Thanks. We'll so I think Congressman Cuellar has given us a great um, segue to this concept of bridges. And we have a, a question uh, from, one of the, uh, from one of the viewers who's asking about uh, what I would call a trade bridge. And this would be the trade bridge between Canada and Mexico. So um, Canada and Mexico uh, are full partners uh, in the Kuzma or the Temec, uh, depending on how you want to refer to it. And I would like to ask uh, Consul General McCormick to weigh in on, uh, give us her thoughts about uh, bilateral trade, but regional trade, particularly with an emphasis on Mexico and Canada. 
Sure, sure. Thank you very much for that question. So, you know, in many ways, it's, it's interesting. We uh, we have this strong trilateral relationship, but we also have three bilateral relationships, and each of those bilateral relationships have their own uh, have their own unique um, connections in history. Um, but in terms of trade, uh, so Canada is second to the U.S. in terms of Mexico's export market. We have about four. So um, it looks like Consul General uh, McCormick, uh, her feed may have frozen a bit. Um, and uh, in the meantime, while we get that reestablished, uh, uh, Consul General Minuti, if you could perhaps offer your thoughts on this, this trade bridge with Mexico and Canada and how uh, relevant that is to this overall picture. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I hope uh, uh, Consul General McCormick joins us in a few seconds. Well, this relationship is so important that I think that we are talking about this treaty because of this relationship between Canada and Mexico. I don't know if it saved the treaty, but it had something very uh, is something very close to that. Absolutely. Remember the the the, the whole process, and I'm proud of that because. That means that we don't have a, a, a preference. We are a, 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 as, as good as a partner of the US as we are uh, uh, of Canada. And uh, fortunately, these, these strong uh, links between Canada and Mexico that are not only commercial, but cultural, uh, political, uh, social, academic, you, you mentioned, uh, or Congressman Cuellar mentioned the students and the institutions, uh, that that is so strong that we showed the U.S. that it was important, as important uh, uh, for each of the three partners to have this treaty. Uh, yes, we complement with Canada as well in a very in a very relevant way. So it is for us Canada is a main player definitely. It wouldn't be enough just to have a two uh, partners uh, treaty. Even, even though the importance of the U.S. for us, and that is our immediate, uh, immediate neighbor, Canada is essential to us as well, and they know it. And the U.S. understood that so well that this made things easier at the end, when they understood that we, and Canada and us, we were as close and as, uh, uh, as synchronized as we were with the U.S., which made things easier and maybe possible. I don't know if this uh, brings something uh, to the discussion, Rob. No, absolutely, uh, Consul General Minuti. I can tell you from my perspective, working in an international law firm with offices in Mexico and in Texas, we have lots of Canadian clients and there's a tremendous amount of, of, of business and trade activity uh, between Mexico and Canada, uh, including in the automotive space and, and, and other sectors. So it is a very relevant topic uh, and uh, I hope that Consul General McCormick uh, can uh, rejoin the call to give her thoughts on that. While we're waiting for that though, uh, Consul General Minuti, uh, another topic that's come up uh, is the question uh, of, of, um, of labor and environmental and some of the labor protections uh, that were built into uh, the USMCA. I know Mexico has, has always had um, very comprehensive labor laws but now has even strengthened those labor laws as part of this USMCA negotiation and approval process. Can you give some of your thoughts on the, let's call it the modernization or even update of Mexican labor protocols and rules as part of the, the TEMEC? Thank you, Rob. You are indeed uh, uh, talking about uh, a very important issue. That, uh, that was actually one of the, uh, discussion points that uh, took longer at the, at, the, at, the, at the last stage. Right. Because we, we do have different labor laws and different labor visions. And it was very interesting uh, that we were able to put them together and to harmonize them some, in, in some way. And it's going to be a win-win-win again, because we are going to improve. Uh, we recognize that we have a lot to do uh, uh, labor-wise, but the same as the U.S. and Canada, we we realized that we all were uh, 
challenge to improve our uh, labor legislations. And now the three of us, we're going to be supervising uh, each other uh, and every single uh, employer is going to have to follow uh, a, a very similar pattern. So the who, who's, who gets the benefits here, the, the workers, the, the, the employees and economy and uh, commerce and production and industries and uh, uh, there's no there's there's no loss here. He, he, everybody wins with this. It is technically difficult. The economies uh, have been running in, in a different uh, speed, so it is hard for Mexico to start paying and competing in the same way as the U.S. and Canada, uh, wage wage uh, wise. But we uh, we agreed in a way that uh, that we think that we within the next uh, six years and nine and ten. We, we were uh, uh, committing to something possible, feasible, and responsible. So we're working on that. We're definitely going to be uh, uh, at, at the same level of the agreement, and we're going uh, to surprise our partners and the world with, with a, a great outcome for this. We're, I'm sure that we're going to, and at the same time, we're getting benefits that without the treaty, we wouldn't be getting. So, right. You know, I insist that we're, we're getting a lot out of this. Right. Yeah, I think it's really true. Um, our law firm is actually publishing legal guides on all of these chapters. And I was looking at the one on labor so that uh, it, it's very clear that, as you said, Consul General Minuti, in the last uh, months of negotiation, uh, there are now uh, mechanisms and, and real panels uh, of U.S. labor leaders and, and Canadian labor leaders and Mexican labor leaders that are going to be monitoring these issues. And hopefully we had a question about, well, how do we avoid job losses? How do we avoid uh, you know, uh, emptying out uh, industrial sectors in one place or the other? And I think that that monitoring and that, that labor cooperation is, is one way to do it, uh, just to address that question. We did have a question from a former uh, World Affairs Council uh, board chair, uh, former managing director of the North American Development Bank. I hope he doesn't mind me. Um, mentioning uh, Raul Rodriguez uh, as a, a, an international leader in his own right. But he asked a very interesting question, Consul General Minuti, about sub-regional uh, co collaboration and sub-regional cooperation so that perhaps not at the, at the national level, but at, say, the state or regional level, we could see agreements uh, and collaboration with Northeast Mexico or uh, the Southwestern United States and so forth. How could that possibly uh, play into this discussion that we're having today? Thank you, Rob, and thank you uh, to Mr. Rodriguez for the question. It is it is very relevant, and it gives us gives us the opportunity to to uh, to elaborate. Well, we are the three of us are big countries, even though Mexico is not as big as the U.S. or Canada. We are big countries, and we are it's natural that we are regionalized. Uh, According to its geography, uh, its own uh, uh, each each other. Uh, I mean, each country is geography, so uh, that has a, an economic impact, of course. So yes, uh, economic regions are created even within the countries, and they have traditionally developed uh, particular areas and uh, industries. Uh, and yes, it, that is and that is going to help because that that means that means uh, uh, that. Our regions are already uh, located and uh, coordinated, and uh, the different uh, um, aspects that will that will bring something to the treaty are are known uh, by the other countries, and uh, we need to be more organized in in taking everything we can from each region. You know that our northern part has a different uh, uh, profile that are the center of the country and and the uh, Gulf and the Caribbean and the Pacific coast, even the Pacific coast that is huge has different areas with different potentials and different industries. So uh, yes, the, the, that is definitely an, uh, that is definitely a factor. That is definitely something to consider to, 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 and a challenge too, to see how is it that we can get the best of each region within our own country and, and uh, related to our two partners. So absolutely, I mean, it will take uh, a long time to start talking about each region and uh, in each country, but that is definitely a key issue. And I thank, I'm thankful for the question. 
Ab absolutely. Um, another uh, board member of the World Affairs Council, um, we're, we're really honored to have everyone who's uh, attending and, and, and viewing the, the presentation today. Uh, she is a, a leader in her own right in international trade, working for a large San Antonio company. Um, uh, Pam Shaw has asked kind of what I would think is a technical question about Annex 5 uh, of the USMCA regarding uh, guidelines for certificates of origin. Um, this is a technical question. Um, I guess Mexico ha has uh, still needs to release some more details on the guidelines for certificates of origin and qualifying for uh, North American content. Do you have any comments or thoughts to, to Ms. Shaw's uh, question, Consul General Minuti? Of course, Rob. I mean, we're, we're here to uh, give as much information as we can about our, our government's position, which is very public already. But yeah, this is a big technical issue. And uh, uh, the, the same way as the labor uh, challenge, this was one of the main players as well at the, at the, uh, during, during the last uh, stage of the process, as, as you well know. And uh, this is one of the biggest challenges of the treaty for the three countries, because the world was organized and set up for a different way to handle things. Where uh, other parts of the world, the regions were specialized in something that we were taking to, to uh, uh, assemble or to build. And, and now we are taking the challenge of pretty much uh, having as many components uh, uh, be, origin, be, be uh, built or uh, come from our region which is a huge challenge, but we all three think that we can handle it. It is a big challenge because for the last 30, 40, 50 years, the world was organized otherwise. So we are trying uh, to, to take advantage of this challenge and, uh, and be more competitive than any other region in the world. I don't have the answer for how long it's gonna take us to reach that. Uh, we think that we're gonna be able to manage this and to uh, meet the, our deadlines. It is a big. It is a big challenge. We think we can do it, and it's going to be, in the long term, a big benefit for us. It's going to be very hard uh, to work it out, but, but we think we we can take advantage in the long run of this challenge that we that we committed. We are we are convinced that we did the right thing. I know that is one of the big questions and issues. How are we going to start? Uh, producing metals or iron from scratch. Right. But we are, we are aware of that. We are, we are very well aware of that and we think we can't meet our goals. Sure. Um, I guess uh, one other question that we've got from a viewer and, and this is a, another uh, leader in, in trade in Texas and in Mexico, uh, my good friend Jorge Canavati has asked Consul General Minuti how we, I guess, as a community uh, here in San Antonio, in Texas, in Mexico, uh, in, in Canada, everywhere, how can we promote uh, and create a, really, I think, a, a North American brand that uh, as a platform that we can use uh, to make that the leading platform for international global business throughout the world? Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on, and we're back to that collaboration and cooperation, but in this sense, as a way of promoting and really selling our North American uh, capabilities. Well, first of all, we we have to show the world that that we that's that's that, that is very interesting. I, I I'm I, I'm with that. I I think we should be an example for the rest of the world, and we need to send the, the message that we that we are together and and we want to be. Uh, the head of uh, these um, platforms or these models or these schemes and um, how well that's an excellent question we we should be very sophisticated in the way that we compete we need to be very transparent we need to be very uh, fair we need to be very open uh, to take uh, to learn from the rest of the world in many ways although we have a long experience here and uh, we, uh, we have, I think, enough uh, elements to be uh, one of the main players and, and to, be, uh, to be followed by many other regions. And, and the best way to do it is 
to, to take as much as we can from this treaty and show that we we enter into this treaty to to make it happen in in in, in, in its uh, um, biggest potential so uh, that's that's what i would answer uh, we, we we can do it and how be very honest with us with ourselves with our uh, treaty with our commitments and uh, try to improve as many uh, challenges and as many uh, issues that we can do internally to to play together as a, a team of three uh, of three uh, partners I, I totally agree. I, I think it's all of our responsibilities, at least to some extent, uh, to uh, to get the message out and, and to, to promote uh, our, our capabilities as a region, uh, for sure. Um, we're, we're starting to come to the end of the, of the time uh, that we have allotted for our discussion today. Um, with that, uh, I, first of all, just for my own personal perspective, like to thank uh, the World Affairs Council and thank Julie Weber and UIW for their sponsorship of this and invitation. Uh, and, and you, of course, uh, Consul General Minuti, our other panelists. And, and with that, I'd like to, to throw it back to Armin at the World Affairs Council. Thank you, Rob. I really appreciate that. Uh, um, I know we have some questions left over, but I respect everyone's time. What we will do is send an email, a follow-up email, uh, with the contact information of uh, the Consul General Minuti and uh, McCormick and Rob, if it's okay to put your information and as well as the Congressman uh, for any follow-up uh, questions or comments and hopefully you don't get harassed too much, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Consul General Minuti, thank you so much for taking time to, uh, to uh, say yes to this uh, without a question. I really appreciate you for jumping in and I look forward to uh, working with you during your tenure here. Uh, we're very lucky to have you. Um, uh, unfortunately, we missed Consul General McCormick um, uh, because of the uh, reception, but um, we thank her as well. Congressman Cuellar, we appreciate them, him as well. And Robert Barnett, a World Affairs Council board member who, uh, who, who said, you know what, if there's any program related to Mexico and US-Mexico and Canada relations, you make sure I'm involved and and uh, I haven't forgotten that. So I really appreciate you, Rob, for uh, taking it up and doing a, uh, a, an awesome job. You'd get a standing ovation if we were uh, doing this in person. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the University of Incarnate Word for sponsoring our uh, webinar and to the Associ uh, Asociación de Empresarios de Mexicanos, AEM, who is uh, our promoting partner. And uh, we wanna thank all of our viewers uh, on Facebook Live uh, for tuning in. We had over 100 uh, actively watching and we had over 100 here uh, and we will send the clip out to you all as a follow-up. Remember, we can't do this without your, your financial support and we can't do this without you all becoming uh, members or renewing your members. So those links will also be included, uh, not only in the chat room, but also in a follow-up email. We definitely need uh, your support to continue these types of programs. Last but not least, we do want to mention because um, of, of the importance of these programs, we're bringing U.S.-Iran relations next Tuesday. So you'll get a you'll get a, a information about that with Dr. Paul Piller from Georgetown University. And a note about um, the uh, French Alliance here in San Antonio. We're joining them to celebrate Bastille Day. So if I've caught your interest with that, there's gonna be food via Zoom. I don't know how we're gonna do it, but it's gonna happen. Uh, so keep in tune with that. Uh, having said that, thank you all for tuning in, supporting the World Affairs Council of San Antonio. Uh, be safe out there and we appreciate all of you and all of your support. Thank you, Armin. Thank you to the audience. It was a very uh, sophisticated audience. I can tell and thank you for inviting us to these uh, kind of uh, events, virtual events. We are proud to participate and please be sure, be certain that the government of Mexico is taking this very seriously because we see our future uh, uh, very, uh, um, very well affected in a, in a very positive way by this uh, treaty uh, 
USMCA, Temec, Kuzma, we, we are convinced and, and we are committed. So be certain that we are putting everything, all our efforts in, the, in the, for this to happen. And thank you again.